Hi students, um, this will be a short lecture on specific uh, artwork and we're going to look at specific sculptures within this artwork. Uh, two dying warriors and of course a, a couple other sculptures within um, the, what we call a pediment at this temple that you see here in the image that I've posted um, at uh, Feia and this is Greek art um, but we're just going to have a little mini lecture specifically about this piece because it's very interesting because it shows us a really cool shift that we see happening um, at this time in ancient Greek history uh, where you have a stylistic shift from what we call the archaic period into the classical period, which most of you are a little bit more familiar with. So I'd like to start with a little map. Um, here you have a mythological map of ancient Greece. Um, Greece encompasses this whole area, and we've looked at a variety of other types of Greek art, but today we're gonna focus on uh, this island, Aegina, it's right here. Um, and of course you can see Athens is right here. That's a town, uh, or um, I guess a city state would have been at this time that many of you are um, aware of. Um, it's also important to take a look at some dates quickly. So Greek art it, within uh, this lecture uh, will basically uh, encompass um, this date period, 900 before the Common Era to about 400. Um, it's also important to note these key terms, BCE and CE. It's likely that many of you have heard these before, but maybe you just don't exactly know how to use them. So this is how uh, historians talk about early history in ancient times. Um, anytime you see BCE, which of course is all of this, um, that means before the Common Era. Uh, it's an, a, sec a secular alternative to what would be traditional, which you also may have heard, which is BC, which means before the time of Christ. But uh, many historians use uh, before the common era because it is more secular um, and um, more accessible to many people. Um, and then you see, and that is before year zero, basically. So you'll notice that as these uh, artworks and as these periods move towards the present, uh, the numbers go become lower, right? So for instance, the geometric period in Greek art ranges from 900 to 700. So uh, 700 becoming close to year zero, at which point we move to calling the years, um, those which would exist in the common era, CE. Um, and of course, this is just another secular alternative to what would traditionally have been called AD. Um, some people say after death, um, also, um, the uh, um, Anno Domini, which otherwise would be, you know, like the year of the Lord. So you can take it or leave it, but this should help you to think about the years. I know many students are confused because they see the years becoming, you know, smaller in number, um, but that's actually because they're moving closer to year zero, at which they start to go up again, of course, to our present period. Um, today we're going to specifically, so there's a lot going on and there's a lot of other videos um, that I've posted this week and readings, of course, which go over the other kind of periods. Today we're going to look at the shift between the archaic period and the early classical period. And to get there, it is important to talk about a few other elements, a few other key terms that'll um, help us to talk about these dying warrior statues that we will be looking at. Um, here are uh, the kind of column, uh, uh, columns that you see um, within this uh, time period, uh, we call these the Greek order, the uh, Greek orders. So there's three different types of orders. The Archaic period encompasses the Doric order and the Ionic, and then the Corinthian comes a little bit later. Just a couple key terms, um, and we're going to look at a few. So I've circled uh, the base. This is the base of the column. Here is the column itself. Uh, we call this part the shaft. At the very top, there's a type of architectural element that we call the capital. Um, you'll notice that the Doric order, which will be the order used on the temple we're about to look at, does not actually have a base specifically. It doesn't have a specific architectural element uh, that is decorative at the base. Um, but all three of the Greek orders do have um, decorative elements at the top, and we call that a capital. And then above that, and probably most importantly for this lecture, is what we call a pediment. I put the term down here as well. A pediment is a triangular gable found at the end of a peaked roof. So you could see this is just half of what the temple would be, um, but it would be a peaked roof, right? And of course, a peak makes a triangle, um, an elongated triangle at the edge there. And oftentimes, artists uh, would 
uh, and architects would put people, sculptures of people in these pediments. And that's what we're going to look at today. So let's get back to our map again. Uh, at this time in history, we had a series of city-states um, in Greece. And many of them would actually fight each other. And so we're going to, uh, you've probably heard of the Spartan Wars, right? Um, there's film, you know, uh, films now that talk about all these things, um, really good films. Um, but we're actually going to talk today about uh, Aegina, where you, at this little island right here that has this wonderful temple. Um, and then we'll talk about how, you know, in between the building of the different pediments on this uh, temple, you have a um, uh, really important war in which the Greeks fight the Persians. And so we'll talk about how that might have shifted the type of architecture that we see here. So here's the temple itself. Obviously, uh, we, we've looked at other types of ancient art. Um, over time, these temples have deteriorated, kind of fallen down, you know, this is what remains of this one. It is from the archaic period, but like I said, there is an important shift that happens uh, in terms of looking at the pediments, where we do find a shift to the classical period. You do see the Doric columns here, right? Um, the pediments were purchased in the early 19th century um, by Ludwig I of Bavaria, and now these do exist in a German museum in Munich. Um, just so you know where they are. Oh, one more term that you don't have to worry a lot about, but this is one that comes up a lot with uh, any kind of discussion about Greek temples and specifically columns um, is intasis. This is the slight swelling within a shaft, right? The part of the column, basically the center part of the column. Um, so what this does is it gives us as a viewers an optical illusion which makes the column appears straight from afar, even though it's slightly tapered and not straight, but it makes it look straight. So this is something that we see often. Again, don't worry too much about that. Now let's take a look at what we would have found in the pediments. So uh, just imagine that there's a nice triangle uh, here at the end and there would be one at either end. And these are the two pediments of this Greek uh, um, temple, which would have been actually don uh, dedicated to uh, a goddess, Aphea, um, but you'll see the goddess Athena is actually represented at center. So obviously they've been taken, they were purchased, and now they exist elsewhere. So let's take a look here. So here you have kind of a black and white image of uh, the um, both ends, um, the west end at top and the east end at bottom. Um, we're going to look at specific warriors here, but I just wanted to show you in this formation so that you can see that uh, as you look at this drawing at the base, um, they would have been a triangular, um, in a triangular pediment area, um, so kind of cool to see that. A couple key terms that I want to bring up as well before we actually talk about these sculptures. So sculpture in the round. This just means, and this is also known as freestanding sculpture. This refers to when sculptures or freestanding or in the round sculptures um, are not attached to architecture or are not within a niche kind of architectural um, space. So you can walk around these sculptures, they're freestanding, they're only attached basically at the feet. Um, and you can look at them from all angles. And this is just a term that is uh, commonly used when we talk about sculpture. So there can be sculpture that is attached to something or that exists in the round or freestanding like you see here. Hierarchic scale. This is also uh, can be seen as hieratic scale. So you can take your pick. I'll probably use hierarchic uh, in the way I talk about it now and maybe in uh, coming uh, assessments. This is where you have the representing of size of figures according to their importance. So we see this throughout ancient art and it's important to note that the Greeks will start to move away from this as they move towards classical style. But it, um, within um, this work here, you still see this happening. So sculptures are bigger if they're more important um, rather than how they should appear objectively in reality, right? Uh, we know that you know gods and goddesses and technically uh, should be the same size as people. Um, however, you always see them depicted as larger, that is because they're more impo important. This also helps us uh, throughout the history of art to find the most important figures in art. So we see it in a variety of ancient civilizations where you have uh, 
uh, an important figure, a ruler, a god, a goddess, being depicted, depicted like way bigger than everyone else. Um, and that's just called hierarchic scale. So we know who's the most important figure here, probably the woman at center. This is the goddess Athena. If we didn't know from the hierarchic scale, uh, she's also got symbols that are associated associated with her as a goddess. Um, you have the sphere, uh, this, um, um, oh, sorry, I lost my a train of thought. You have the shield here, a very specific helmet that would have been associated with her and images of her. And then you also see a spear that she holds. It's important to know that all of these, many of these actually have been replaced and are now just modern uh, objects um, that, you know, probably would have um, um, not uh, persevered uh, over time, but that have been re-added to the sculpture in the museum um, so that we can better understand uh, the battle scene here. So it's important to note those are added uh, modern uh, uh, additions. And then uh, to tag on to that, and this is a very similar term, we have hierarchic placement. So it's a lot like the other term. This is instead of making figures bigger, figures are placed in specific uh, um, um, figurations based on how important they are. So most important figures are at center, least important figures are to, to the sides. Uh, once again, easy to find Athena here at the center and she would be on both sides. Obviously you see um, that the uh, other side, the east side of the pediment is not as well intact. So you basically just have fragments, um, but you, know, you have Athena's head here at the other side. And again, she's bigger, but also she's at center. So we definitely know that she's most important here. And now let's take a look at the pediment itself. So it is a triangular figure. Um, this is awkward. Um, it becomes a kind of an issue for designers, uh, architects who are working uh, within this, you know, space. Um, how do we, because it's not like we want this, the um, warriors should technically be around the same size as each other, right? But how are we going to make them the same size as each other? uh when we have a space that tapers at the edges well this was a very difficult dilemma uh when artists uh, and architects were working with the pediment as a design space but here at agena uh it's became kind of a creative design standard because uh, artists really worked hard to make sure they could still fit these warriors into the pediment design element um, but um, they were able to use them in different ways to make them shorter and so that the uh, they can be large, you know, full scale humans, uh, but uh, get shorter towards the edges. So what we have here is what it could have been an awkward design, but then actually turned out to be a genius uh, kind of creative standard um, for design and putting uh, full scale people in pediments. And so what you have here is basically a military uh, a war. Um, so the pediment, this pediment, um, this is the pediment on the west side, was created probably, um, we believe, between 500 and nine, uh, 490, um, maybe into the 470s before the Common Era. And this is when it's believed that the temple was actually uh, constructed. So they did this side first, and this is very much still within the archaic style, and we'll look at these warriors closely to get a better, um, um, a better um, understanding of what that means. So this would have been a local, uh, a battle of local warriors in a military expedition against Troy. So this would have, uh, have been an important battle. As we see, of course, Athena's at center. It's important to note she is the goddess of war, so it makes sense. She's also the goddess of wisdom. Uh, it makes sense that, that she's here at center. And what terms might you use to describe this? Just to jog your memory a little bit. Maybe you think about hierarchic scale, right? Or hieratic scale, hierarchic placement, right? She's at center in the largest and likely the warriors at center maybe may, uh, are more important as well. And then of course, sculpture in the round if you wanna bring that one in as well or freestanding sculpture. So anyway, this is a, the, how were, uh, sculpt, how were 
uh, sculptors uh, able to figure out the best way to make this kind of tapered design? Well, you can look to the warriors right next to Athena, right? She stands up tall. She is bigger than everyone else. Um, it's not just that she has straight legs. She also is actually bigger. Um, but the two warriors who flank her are bending their knees, right? Um, they're making sure uh, that they're a little bit smaller. And this is done by bending knees just slightly so they're shorter. And then as you move to the outside of the triangular fixture, um, you have uh, people who are bent down even more, crouching. And then at the very end, fallen warriors, right? This works really well within that design. And at the end, you have warriors who are just about to die. And these are the ones who we are going to look at specifically. And the two I want to look at specifically are this one here on the outside and on the other side, um, on the east side of the pediment, we have one as well. Now, when we look at the two pediments, these were done about 10 years apart, okay? So let's look specifically at those and bring those up real quickly. One important key note that I want to emphasize is that even though we do tend to really think a lot about these sculptures as being beautiful white marble sculptures, um, they actually would have been painted highly uh, um, uh, ornamentalized, they would have had weapons that were made of real bronze and real metals, and they would have been painted like you see this fellow here. And of course, now we see him as completely, you know, just white marble, but he would have had a full, very bright outfit. And that was probably symbolic of the specific um, armored uh, wear that they, these warriors actually would have worn at the time. But let's take a specific look at these two warriors here. So as I said, the dying warrior on this and on the west pediment is from the archaic period. And we'll talk about what that means in just a second. Um, so we have specifics of that that have to do with the archaic period. And then this one that's done about 10 years later, perhaps in the 470s as well. Again, a few theories will come up later in the lecture, um, is apparently done about 10 years later. But let's talk about the archaic style and what it means. Um, so if we look to this fellow, we see something very similar to what we see in early Greek art. Uh, and these figures we would call the koros uh, or the kori, depending. These are uh, terracotta figures, clay fired over low heat. Oftentimes um, you have limestone that was sometimes used, sometimes wood, um, but we're looking at the style here. So we really wanna emphasize um, these figures are usually nude. You do have a female here. The females were like, uh, often clothed, representing deities, priestesses, nymphs. But the males were used, usually representing gods who would, or athletes or warriors who would have been represented as nude. Um, these were uh, sometimes uh, could be found at graves and sanctuaries and were oftentimes fully painted. But let's look at this style. So this is pretty rigid, right? If I were to stand up and stand like this, that would be a little bit awkward. We know this is not how we naturalistically stand, right? Hands at our sides, one foot a little bit forward, you know, barely any motion. And then look at the hair. It's very stylized as well. Um, this would have been... Uh, a symbol symbolic of some type of curls or braids or something like that. So this is not very realistic, but it's moving towards realism. So let's see how that uh, uh, and let's see where that comes from. Well, we have a lot of influence from the ancient Greeks, and this is something that's already been covered in the class. And if you look to ancient Greeks, you also have that real interest in uh, rigidity, right? Hands at the sides, a real connection to the stone that is being uh, the uh, sculptures are being carved from. You see here at this piece from Giza, um, there's still actually the stone is in between the two figures. It's very sturdy. And then as we move to ancient Greek, we see a little bit of a move away from that. We still have the stone, you know, used to secure the arms to the hips and so forth. But there's a move away from that. But we still have the intense rigidity here. Um, and then the Greeks were still very interested in using geometry, a geometry and mathematics to kind of calculate the human body. And we'll see how that moves a little bit as we talk about um, uh, the Doriferous. And I posted a video about that as well. So make sure you check that out. And that is kind of the full shift into the classical period where you have a real interest in naturalism, you know, 
actually moving the body as it would be naturally standing with a bend in one knee, right? The way that you and I would actually stand if we were just hanging out with friends or something like this. Um, and if we look closely at the face, we see what we call the archaic smile. And this is another key term. Here's the warrior we're kind of just looking at. We're going to uh, move back to him in a moment. Um, but this is very common in the archaic period to have this kind of slight um, closed lip expression that we call the archaic smile. And it's really not very emotional. It doesn't really tell us anything about uh, these sculptures or how they were feeling, um, but it's very common in terms of stylism. So the conventional closed lip expression, it was interpreted as a way of representing emotion and naturalism, but as we'll see, it ended up, you know, uh, the shift into the classical uh, moved us much more close uh, to the actual kind of interest in naturalism and emotion. And just to kind of go back to Egypt again here, we have kind of a, a bit of a progression. Uh, I'll move this screen here so you can see the Critias boy. Um, so we have a move away from that rigidity slowly, a, a much more of an interest in the way that flesh, uh, one's skin falls over the muscles of the body. So we have more of an interest in muscles, but also still idealism. And then finally we have the Critias boy. And then right after him, we'll also have uh, what we call the Deriferous, uh, the video that I have posted, and you can take a look at it to that, where we have the real interest in what we call contrapposto. And that's another key term, and that will be covered in the other video as well. Um, but this is basically this kind of naturalistic lean of the hip, the movement of weight to one side of the body, the arms would be bent here. And this is how you and I typically would stand, much, much less rigid, much more of an interest in realism in the human body. And now let's move back to those warriors quickly as we finish the lecture. So which one's more realistic? Um, when you look to the warrior on this side, on the west side of the pediment, right, from uh, obsessively from 10 years earlier, um, what's going on with this fellow? Okay, he's dying. Um, he has been shot in the chest. He's fallen, uh, but he gives us that smile. He still looks to us. Um, he's about to take, try to take that weapon out of his chest. I'd imagine that would not feel good, but he doesn't seem to be giving us any indication of that kind of uh, painful emotion that you might have. You can also notice the way that he's fallen. Um, if I was, you know, shot in the chest, do you think I would fall so gracefully like this, right? With his, uh, he's got uh, basically two triangles created by his leg here and then his arm. Uh, actually another third with this arm. So as I said earlier, an interest in geometry, geometric shapes becoming natural in the body. And we know now, of course, that's not natural at all. If I was shot with something in the chest, I'd probably flop over and it would not be graceful in the least. So we know this, right? And so we can pick this out and say, okay, that doesn't look very naturalistic. The way that he's fallen you know, even the way that he's um, um, stylized, we would call this with his hairstyle, this is very archaic, his smile, his eyes, um, and even his musculature, it's, it's, it's very idealized, very stylized. In other terms, it's slightly abstracted compared to what we'll see only 10 years later uh, on the East Pediment. So let's take a look at the East Pediment. So this is much more realistic, right? This is another warrior who's also dying. Um, he's also been shot you can see the, a wound here. Um, I also want to mention that these uh, holes that you see here would have also uh, would, been, would have been places to secure uh, you know, actual armor, um, bronze, metals that would have been placed over these sculptures up on the pediment at the temple, uh, which of course are no longer existing today. So he's also been shot, but he falls much more naturally. Um, he falls to his side. He doesn't even look at us, which that seems about right. If I'm getting shot, I probably won't be looking up uh, to, to people. Um, he's leaning his weight into his shield. He's about to fall forward. There's a real interest in dynamism and movement as he falls. Um, he's not well, right? And he gives us a slight smile, still that archaic smile. Um, but you can tell there's a real interest in naturalism, not only in the movement of the body and the way that flesh is then uh, uh, um, drapes over uh, the muscles and the skeletal structure. You have a real interest in naturalism and not such a kind of presentation as you have up top here in the human body, um, but rather a real interest in emotion 
and realism. And this is the big shift that we see from archaic into the early classical period. So here we have actually sympathize with this warrior a lot more than we might sympathize with the other. So why might this be? Only 10 years difference, right? Uh, so um, the other key thing to bring up here is that there's a big, uh, important war uh, with the Persians in which the Greeks actually defeat the Persians. The Greeks come together and they've been fighting one another prior to this. And they come together right in between this period of construction of these two pediments and they defeat the Persians. And this is something they didn't think could be done. The Persian army was huge. It was really unlikely that they would be victorious here, yet they were. So there's kind of a new outlook on life at this time. Um, Greeks had just defeated the Persians and they're starting to kind of uh, feel like everything in the universe is coming together. There's a new interest in the power of the human, the human body, the individual individual, the mind, um, all these things are coming to the fore at this time. Um, so some scholars have suggested that that might be specifically due to uh, this shift to the, to the classical where there's more of an interest in humanism, right, an interest in the human body and also uh, realistic representations. The other theory that actually scholars have been bringing up as well uh, lately is that these may have been done, and this is why I write 470s possibly, around the same time. In 470 of the common, uh, before the common era, where you have two different workshops probably coming um, at different times and the earlier workshop being a little bit more uh, conservative in the archaic style and the later workshop perhaps being a little more progressive moving towards the classical and the realistic style. So these are two theories that I'm going to have you think about for this week. Um, this is going to be part of what you find in the discussion form. So make sure that you watch the videos, uh, other videos that are posted uh, before you present uh, before you present your post there. Um, and I look forward to hearing from you soon on those.